Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Civita Breakfast, today as a digital stream only. However, we plan to arrange events with live physical audience. In fact, we have already started, but today it's a digital stream. My name is Erik Lekke, I'm a fellow here at Civita, and I will be this morning's host as we discuss Afghanistan and its future under the Taliban regime. Obviously, the public attention is focused on Ukraine, which we in Civita also continue to focus on. However, it is important not to forget other global challenges like Afghanistan. Last summer, the Taliban overthrew the Ghani government and re-emerged re as Afghanistan's ruling power following the withdrawal of US and NATO troops. How will the Taliban govern this time? Are the last 20 years of progress of women's rights and education in danger? How can Norway and the rest of the international community influence the development? Is lasting peace under Taliban possible? Today's speakers are Ine Eriksen Søreide, Chair of the Standing Committee of Foreign Affairs and Defense, Samina Ansari. She is a leader of Ariana Diplomacy and has worked in Afghanistan for many years. Uh, Eldridge Adolfo, senior peace mediator for Folke Bernadotte uh, Academy, and Yama Volosmal, Middle Eastern correspondent for the Norwegian Broadcasting NRK. Before we start, let me give you some practical details. Due to the war in Ukraine, Yama Volosmal had to travel from Beirut, Beirut to Ukraine, make it, which makes make it more difficult for him to join us live. Nevertheless, I pre-recorded a 10-minute conversation with Yama, which you will get in about 60 seconds. Let me also inform you that Eldritch Adolfo is joining through video link yeah, if, our technical, uh, <laughs> if the technical aspects is in order, which I hope they are while Samina and Ine joins me here from Akasgata 20 in our improvised studio. We would very much like to hear your comments and uh, questions. Uh, please share in the uh, comment field below the stream here or on social media with hashtag Civita Focust. This meeting will finish no later than nine o'clock. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Our first speaker is Yama Volsmal, which I talked to earlier. Let's hear his thoughts. Yama Volsmal, correspondent at NRK. Thank you so much for joining and sharing your thoughts on the development in Afghanistan. My pleasure. Uh, just let's start with the development since 2002 and two, uh, now when the Taliban took over. There was a lot of critical journalism and rightly so about all the problems in, in Afghanistan. But, but what was the development in the big picture? Uh, were, were the positive developments for Afghanistan? Did they, say, did, did they see real improvements? Listen, by the time the international forces uh, entered Afghanistan in 20, uh, 2001, Afghanistan could be described as, as a big, black, miserable hole. Everything had gone in the wrong direction there. There had been decades of war, zero development. People were tired. They were, they were exhausted of all the conflicts. And in comes the international community. Everybody takes them in with open arms. Suddenly, after decades of conflict, you had the full attention of the international community with aid pouring in, money pouring in, opportunities pouring in. So it was uh, no doubt that in the past 20 years, Afghanistan saw immense development in the field of women. Never before have Afghan women, women for example, had so many rights written in law, in the constitution. For example, they had representation in the parliament. They weren't banned from leading positions in the government. We had female ministers. Uh, Education-wise, never before has Afghanistan experienced this kind of revolution when it comes to the education. So they had access to all kinds of education. With regards to physical development, Afghanistan has never seen this kind of focus on its infrastructure. It's a historic event that you see thousands of thousands of kilometers of roads being built in these past 20 years. This made life much easier for Afghanistan, a, a country which is divided by huge mountains, you know. Uh, in healthcare, over 60% of Afghans had access to basic healthcare in their nearby villages. That's historic. 
So we can't say that everything went wrong in Afghanistan over the past 20 years when the Western countries were involved. A lot of things went from bad to much better. So given your description now, what went wrong? Why did the, the Taliban come back? Listen, that's the million dollar question nobody has been able to answer on my numerous trips to Afghanistan. I've talked to Western leaders, I've talked to experts, I've talked to military experts. There is not a single answer on how this happened. I can, from my experience, try to put this puzzle together and I'll give you a relevant example. Uh, to me, it's, it's a mystery how the West squandered this historic opportunity in Afghanistan when they came in as liberators in 2001 with their money, with their forces. I, 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 I went to Afghanistan back then and I met no Afghans who were critical of the Western involvement in their country. They welcomed everything the Westerners said because they were so exhausted uh, because of the conflict. How we went from that to being chased out of the, out of the country back in August, uh, humiliated, trying to flee the country through Kabul airport, that to me is a mystery. How we went from the, 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 uh, the way we were greeted as Westerners to the way we left the country 20 years ago, nobody's been able to answer that. But I can give you an example from Faria province where Norwegian forces uh, were stationed for a number of years. Norway spent millions and millions of dollars on aid there. One of the reasons, there is never a black and white answer in Afghanistan with these complex conflicts, but I can give you one example. In Faria province, I went there several times and I saw how the security situation went from relatively peaceful to deteriorating every time I went there. I talked to the commanders on the ground and they told us when we traveled to villages, because of the security situation, often the Norwegian forces were the one who had good contact with local forces, all right? They met uh, village leaders, they would meet them, they would invite them for dinner, drink tea with them. The village elders would say, listen, we need clinics, we need roads, we need uh, clean water. Can you guys help us with this? The Norwegian forces didn't have a budget, so they would go back to the PRT, the base, and communicate with the foreign ministry who had the responsibility for the aid. But the foreign ministry had their own set of rules. They did not want to mix military and civilian assistance. And this is, it's a commendable principle on paper, but in reality, in a country like Afghanistan, it caused serious problems because those commanders, Norwegian commanders who went to the villages and were greeted as guests were a few years later attacked by the same villagers. There had been a, a shift in the way people saw the foreign forces. And I found out on the ground that a lot of the villagers were approached by the Taliban, telling them, listen, the foreign forces have been here for five, 10 years now. Have they solved your problems? Did you get that school? Did you get that clean water? Did you get the clinic you've been begging for for years? No. So why don't you join forces with us? And that's one of the reasons why we saw the shift among the people from backing the idea of NATO, the idea of, you know, uh, the Western project uh, projects to shifting their alliance with the Taliban, you know? So this is just one small example of what went wrong in Faria province. And these examples were all over Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, you did cover uh, the, when Taliban took over uh, Afghanistan again last, last summer and are now in control of uh, the country. What is your assessment of the situation in Afghanistan now? It's, it's, it's a shame that the, the, the Afghanistan is totally out of the news cycle for natural reasons after what happened in Ukraine and in the invasion uh, by the Russians. But, but the dire situation there continues. There is still an ongoing humanitarian crisis. There is little help pouring into Afghanistan from being uh, super dependent on foreign aid, you know, uh, to, to cutting off that aid like in a blink of a second then you can realize how the situation is on the ground. But I see some development on the ground. I see that the Taliban are trying to put in place a functioning government. I see that they're collecting taxes. They're collecting tolls. Uh, they're exporting Afghan goods to neighboring countries. So they have a big source of income. And they claim that they are uh, paying back uh, public servants who hadn't been paid in the last months of the for, for, uh, former regime, they're paying these people their salaries now. Teachers are being paid. Doctors are being paid. 
Um, so obviously that helps a lot for the life uh, in the life of Afghans. Uh, but there are still immense, immense challenges the country is facing. Mm. Um, is Taliban uh, anno 2001 and Taliban today the same movement or are there significant differences? Their core ideology is the same. Okay, so they still adhere to a very, very strict interpretation of Islam, of Sharia, the Islamic laws. And they're actually the only movement in the world that has put in place such strict rules. It's interesting for me to see how countries they were inspired by, like Saudi Arabia, who actively exported this way this, this, this form of Islam, which is radical, keep the women at home, don't give them any liberties, the men should run the country, you should have strict punishment for uh, any laws that are bro- broken by the public. Even Saudi Arabia is now changing. They've, they've, they've abolished the religious police, they're, they're opening up to the world, and the Taliban are going 10 steps back. So it's interesting for me to see this. So, so their ideology is still the same. But I could say that the biggest difference between their movement now uh, as to 20 years ago is their leadership. Their leadership, although it's a lot of the same people, they have realized that they cannot live in isolation. Back 20, 22 years ago when they were in power, they really believed that God, Allah, could take care of them no matter what. They didn't need the world. You know, they got the country. Somehow God is going to help them run the country. This has changed. The leadership realizes now that they cannot run the country in isolation. They need to have dialogue with the international community. They need to do diplomacy. That's why they're they're sending their envoys left, right, and center to Western countries, to neighboring countries. They know they can't do this alone. And in that willingness to have a dialogue with the outside world is a hope of change because that gives the Western countries um, a possibility to pressure the Taliban to move them in the right direction. Now, that being said, forget about Afghanistan turning into a liberal Western democracy. That's never going to happen. They don't acknowledge democracy. But we have an opportunity because they are listening to us to move them at least in some ways in the right direction. And we see some results with regards to education for women. Now they're opening up universities for women. So it's small baby steps in the right direction if the West engages with the Taliban. Mm. Uh, interesting, Yama. And, and final question. Uh, how is it to do journalism in Afghanistan? My impression was that one of the real improvements in Afghanistan was that they had a real independent journalistic community. Uh, I can imagine that it's somewhat difficult to be a critical investigative journalism being an Afghan, probably easier being a, a foreign co- correspondent. What's your view? It's very good, Eric, that you reminded me. I should have, of course, listed that as one of the biggest achievements. Definitely, the Afghan journalism was one of the biggest achievements over the past 20, 21 years. Afghan journalists were, were, you know, they they were like a shining example, not only in Afghanistan, but in the whole region. Um, you, if you saw the interviews that Afghan journalists were, were doing with, with, you know, warlords, powerful people, the way they were questioning them, um, um, you know, it was, it was really heartwarming to see as a journalist. All that is gone now. All that is gone. Uh, local journalists are facing intimidation. Officially, the Taliban are saying we have freedom of uh, speech, but uh, nobody is allowed to offend our leadership. Now, define how you offend the leadership. Is it by asking tough questions? I don't know, but the result is local journalists have been jailed. They're being intimidated. They're being told uh, in the newsrooms, you should have Taliban people, intelligence people coming in saying, listen, we know you're gonna run this show. Be careful about how, what kind of questions you ask. We don't like this focus. So the result is local journalists are, are now exercising high degree of self-censorship. Okay, so so all that gain, all that, you know, achievements in the press, it's gone. Uh, Most of the prominent journalists have left the country. The ones who are left, their hands and and legs are tied, basically, because of all these restrictions. As a foreign correspondent, I still have the freedom to go into Afghanistan. But, you know, people don't speak to you in the same way they did before because they fear repercussions from the Taliban. So, yes, the media landscape has changed immensely. Yama, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And and it's more important than ever that you keep doing your critical investigative journalism. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Eric. That was Yama Volosmal, who uh, now has traveled to, to Ukraine to keep doing his investigative uh, journalism, which is so uh, important. Um, let me start with you, uh, Ina. Uh, obviously, uh, we will look at the, the future more than the, the past, but uh, still I want to start asking you about your impression. You have been in government during much of the period that the, the West was involved in Afghanistan. Between 2001 and 2021, the big picture, well, were there real improvements uh, for the Afghan people, in your view? Well, I can subscribe to very much of what Yama says, that Taliban right now meets a very different Afghanistan compared to 2001. And one of the, of course, most uh, prominent features is everything from life expectancy, who has risen from, uh, I think, 56 to 64 years. You have the child mortality rate being cut in half. Uh, you have a lot of more people having access to clean water, which, which is always a very good indicator of where things are going. So whereas in, I think, 2001, there were some 16% who had access to clean water, now it is 89%. And twice as many girls are enrolled in schools. Uh, um, Yama also pointed to something that I think has been a very important driver in this development, and that is uh, both media freedom but also media diversity. Many of these very uh, prominent features and very important developments have of course also been in a way overshadowed by what has been an endemic corruption which has been completely paralyzing much of the Afghan society and the ability to govern. Uh, it has also caused legitimacy challenges for the government, and that has also been one of um, the donors' most kind of pressing issues towards the government, especially over the past, I would say, five to six years, to, to deal with this corruption. So, so I think that there are many good features um, that, that I think makes the Taliban now also have to adjust when they um, seized power, uh, that they are now meeting a very, very different society, will not necessarily accept being treated the same way as things were in 2001. But also, of course, uh, enormous challenging uh, circumstances in, in many aspects. So, um, but but I, will, I, I very much concur with Yama when he says that, that those who feel that uh, everything has gone wrong uh, ever since um, 2001, they are mistaken because many things have gone in the right direction. The problem is now to, in a way, keep these, um, keep these very, um, I would say, very good progress in, in many fields. And that is not an easy task because you now have a ruling in Afghanistan that is completely different from what it was. Yeah, uh, we're very soon going to move to, to, to the future, but a follow-up uh, in, a, and there are people who say that we should have never been in Afghanistan uh, on behalf of Norway and, and probably also the international community. Do you have any regrets that we did invest so many money and stayed so long in Afghanistan? No, I don't. Uh, first of all, it was important for us as part of the international society and a part of NATO to respond when one of our allies uh, was attacked. And the coalition, I think, at its most counted some 83 uh, countries and organizations. Uh, but we can, of course, always look into, and that has been done widely in Norway as well, uh, whether or not there were things during our 20 years in Afghanistan that could have been different or better. For instance, one of the things that I, I we talked a lot about um, in the in the early years was the very sharp division between civilian and military uh, efforts that sometimes made it very difficult to actually assist with what was needed because there was a very strict separation that was, I think, a very... Um, a very good thing on the drawing board, but in reality, on the ground, it didn't work as uh, as expected. On the contrary, I think it undermined some of um, some of the efforts. But overall, I sincerely think that our efforts, both the military ones, uh, those who uh, dealt with the humanitarian efforts, but also um, the political part of this, has been important. The progress that that we just mentioned and Yama also mentioned uh, would not have been possible without this. Mm. Samina, uh, you have a background from Afghanistan and, and you have uh, spent many years in Afghanistan. Seen from your point of view, how has the development been uh, the last years during the West? I mean, I would very much echo what Ina is saying here because there was a lot of progress in Afghanistan the last 20 years. Uh, and I will say that the key to that progress was a lot of 
open minds and hearts mm. because a lot of young Afghans started believing that they can rebuild their country with uh, almost 40 years of war behind them uh, as a heritage. Uh, and in many ways, I think that they succeeded on so many areas. Uh, and the key achievement uh, for me personally was to see a civil society, mm -hmm. an active civil society, because Afghanistan in the 90s that my parents left barely had a civil society. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the unfortunate part uh, in this is that they didn't have a crucial role in deciding for what happened with Afghanistan afterwards. Uh, but I do feel for the people of Afghanistan right now uh, because there is a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I know we will speak about this later on, uh, but I think Afghans could see this uncertainty come way before the international community managed mm -hmm. to put together their minds um, and before the devastating thing happened on August 15. Mm. Uh, Eldridge, uh, can you hear me? You're, you're on the video link. Yes, thank you. I can hear you. Excellent. Eldridge, uh, the big picture, what's your view? You've also been active in, in Afghanistan for many years. Did we see real improvements in, in, in the country for the 20 years that the West uh, uh, spent uh, trying to make development? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think I, I want to first agree with both uh, uh, Ian and, and Samina that there's been a lot of uh, uh, development. And I think um, to some extent, of course, we, we also have to be careful uh, there were problems. Uh, uh, Ian talked about uh, the corruption and things like this one. And then the government as well, its inability to govern as a democracy. But these are things that take a long time to develop. It's taken us hundreds of years in Europe to develop. So to expect Afghanistan in 20 years to be perfect uh, is, is unreasonable. But the progress there was significant. You now had political parties before you didn't have that. Even if there were uh, uh, discrepancies between the parties and stuff, but you actually had a political engagement. More importantly, and I'll speak more at the political level, I guess, is that you also had an engagement of civil society and other groups. And when I say civil society, I'm not speaking only about NGOs. I'm talking about even grassroots organizations, uh, uh, ulema, traditional leaders, who have come to expect to be consulted and to also have a say in what uh, happens in governance, which was not there before. But this is an expectation that's there now. And it's going to be a big challenge for the Taliban to be able to manage this because uh, this is not something they're uh, uh, familiar with. They prefer to have a, a council that would decide everything. But this is a different society. Uh, and, and, and I think already we see the eruptions in Afghanistan where people want to be heard, people want to have a say in the government. So that in itself is, is a huge step in, in progress, if you ask. Hmm. Uh, in, in, it just struck me that uh, it was just when the Taliban seized power again, we start talking about all the progress in Afghanistan. I mean, the narrative during the 20 years was, uh, and not without reason, was with all the problems that mm. people didn't see real improvements, they didn't see any developments and, and, and so on. But, but moving to, to the future, is all these developments and progress in danger now with the Taliban? Well, I think it is uh, to, to a great extent in danger. And, and the reason, of course, is to look at what the Taliban not only are saying, but actually are doing. And I think one of the progresses that, that we haven't talked about is also that there were, to a certain extent, to certain ethnic groups, a reduction of violence and persecution uh, during the past 20 years. This has now picked up again. Uh, and the Taliban is um, going after certain uh, ethnic groups in a way that they haven't seen for, for the past 20 years. I think, though, that, that we have, at least some of us have tried also to talk about the gains and the, and the progress that has been made. But I don't think any of us are under any illusion that this is going to continue under the current rule. And there are many reasons for that, and we probably will get into some of them later on. But, but of course, one of the reasons is that the Taliban, I think, basically is not a different Taliban. It hasn't changed in their minds, uh, their, their viewpoints, and more or less their objectives and goals. They have changed somewhat in how they present themselves and, and how they interact with the international community. I mean, we have from Norway's side had a dialogue with the Taliban for the past 13 to 14 years. But they, they of course, presented themselves in a different way and interact differently. That does not mean that they are in a position where they are planning to, to govern in a more modern way. So I think that we have to be very, very mindful of the fact that this is a movement that basically 
has very different ideas on how to run a society that basically have a very different set of values compared to uh, what we see uh, in the West and in many regional countries as well. And and one of the, I would say, the, the litmus test is, of course, many, but allowing uh, education for girls will be one. Human rights and abiding by human rights will be another. But those are only a couple of test stones in all of this uh, that I think will be very, very challenging moving ahead. Mm. Samina, you mentioned the, the civil society. Uh, um, not, uh, I haven't read thoroughly what the Taliban thinks of the civil society, but my impression is that uh, they haven't uh, uh, any big thoughts for it. What's, what's your view and your fear for civil society in Afghanistan moving forward? Is it going to cease to exist like it uh, did in 2001 or didn't? I mean, just to build up on the first question that yeah. I got earlier today, there was a lot of progress, but Afghanistan uh, was definitely not a peaceful country the last mm -hmm. 20 years. And there was a lot of indication from Taliban already the last 20 years that they were very much against civil society's activities. And we saw this through a number of targeted killings towards journalists, young um, advocates of women's rights, human rights. But we also saw it in terms of attacks on young educated youth. Mm. So to build further from that, uh, you know, those incidents, we can now conclude that Taliban are not incredibly open when it comes to civil society engagement. At the same time, I'm no Taliban expert because I believe that Taliban are incredibly difficult to read. They're very vague, and I think that they know that they benefit from being very vague in terms of what type of governance they will have, what do they accept, what do they not accept. But the key here is that, um, like Ina was saying earlier, we have to look at their actions. And right now, one key action that we can keep an eye on is girls' education. And all Muslim, all Islamic countries are allowing their girls to go to school. And right now, Taliban are the only de facto government that have given an empty promise of allowing girls to go to school by end of March. Mm. But we still see that many girls in many provinces are not going to school quite yet. Mm. So what are your friends in Afghanistan, your contacts in the civil society uh, in the country saying? What, what, what are their hopes or, or fears for the future? There's still a little movement, uh, not to the degree that we uh, can imagine, because I know that there has been some pictures of uh, women marching in the streets, asking for their rights, etc. But those are just small pockets of movements. I think that just echoing what Yama was saying earlier, there's a lot of fear. Uh, people are not expressing themselves the same way as they were before the takeover. Uh, so I think that a lot of uh, Afghans in Afghanistan, they are still hurt, they're traumatized by what happened. And at the same time, uh, there's no trust in the Taliban regime whatsoever. And people are just waiting. And then on top of that, there's a humanitarian mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. mm. Eldridge, um you mentioned, Asian and Samina, that the progress we have seen in Afghanistan the last 20 years, which are not now in, in, in danger. How do you read the, the Taliban regime and, and, and how do you think they will govern uh, now on? Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult question. Uh, uh, and, and have they changed? Have they not? You know, it's, it's really a question to be asked. But I think one thing we have to remember as well is the Taliban is a movement. And the movement also always, and we've seen this in other places, comprises of a number of conflicting, even unholy alliances sometimes. So within the Taliban, you have sections, groups, and I, and I know this for a fact, who uh, want to do things a little bit differently. I'm not saying they've completely changed, I'm not saying it's a revolution, uh, but the other groups who don't. And, and that reconciliation within the group itself is going to take some time. I think we see that already in the way the government, the interim government was constituted. Again, it is, a, 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 yes, people say that the particular faction won, but I think it is also a reflection of the challenges within the movement itself. So that's gonna to have to settle at some point. Yeah, and, and once it settles, then we'll be able to see who has won, who hasn't won. But I do think that will be a much more of a compromise. The Taliban, have they changed fundamentally in their ideology, in their way they see the world? No, I wouldn't say that, but I would say that they may have a change in some of the approaches to the way they are willing to do. Mm. The question is how, and again, we're going to the future now, how do we help them think through those things? How does it become possible to show that, uh, uh, Samina mentioned women's education, yeah? 
uh, and women's empowerment, women's role in, in society. But this is not anti-Islamic, and it's not anti-Sharia either. If you go into Sharia law, women have rights, and they have rights. And I think a, a clear example is recently there was a decree by the Taliban that said all women are citizens now, and they uh, would marry who they want. You cannot force them to marry. Uh, the husband cannot take it. I mean, okay, they're already expressing some idea that of citizenship in the fact that women could have agents. So I think there are things that if we look at it without only just looking at it skeptically and in a, in a total terms, it's either this or that, I think there are areas that if you are careful and helpful, we could actually move some of the stuff and preserve some of these gains of the last 20 years. I'm by no means or any stretch of the imagination saying that we'll have a democracy under the Taliban. I'm not saying that. And no, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that some things can be preserved mm. if we approach a problem. That's interesting uh, in a, to see if there's a wind of opportunity to influence the Taliban uh, government uh, uh, now. Um, what's your view on this? Have the Norway and the international community any, any, any opportunity to influence? Well, I think there is a very, um, in a way, difficult situation also within the Taliban right now. And Elrich uh, alluded to that. At least we have three factions. Uh, and right now, um, the faction who led the negotiations in Doha are the are the weakest ones uh, at the moment. They have less influence than the military wing and also the Haqqani network, which makes it, of course, difficult to find a way or an entry point for, for this influence. Is this the sort of the liberal part of the Taliban? <laughs> I, I would never uh, label anything as liberal when it comes to the <laughs> Taliban, but um, it is at least the wing or the faction that has been in Doha leading negotiations and also, I would say, been most exposed to, to Western influence uh, over the past years. Norway also had observers in Doha that, that were interacting uh, with the Taliban and also the government side in order to find um, to find solutions. Having said that, um, they also have an external challenge, uh, which is uh, ISIS in Khorasan province, which is a which provides real threat to the Taliban and to to govern for the Taliban, uh, which also can reduce the possibility to influence in the right direction when it comes to all of these things that that we both have mentioned. So I'm. Um, I'm a bit weary of, of how, at this juncture, um, there is a possibility to, to influence because uh, of the division within the Taliban, the external threats, and of course also the fact that uh, we need to keep up the international pressure on, on this. Right now, there are so many crises in the world, both humanitarian and political crises, that it is a tendency that the pressure will probably not be kept up in the same way from, from all the actors who were very I would say, unified uh, around August 15 and, and in the immediate aftermath. Mm. So I think there is a window, um, but I think the challenge right now is that the most susceptible window to this, um, to this influence is the weakest part of the Taliban right now. Mm. Uh, and a quick follow-up, uh, in a Norway facilitated talks here in, in Norway, uh, in, in Oslo with the Taliban, a lot of people reacted to that, understandably so. Uh, what's your view? Was that right? And what did you, what do you think came out of these talks, if anything? Well, I, I, it's very understandable that it creates a lot of, um, I would say, mixed emotions, both in Norway and anywhere else, uh, due to the brutality that the Taliban has inflicted on the Afghan people and globally uh, for, for many, many years. At the same time, um, I think it is right to keep that uh, dialogue open. And I think it's important to remember that the, the talks in Oslo were not between Norway and the Taliban. It was between the international community, the US, the UN, the EU and, and others and the Taliban in, in an effort to try to, to influence. Whether or not that was successful, I think is too soon to say. But uh, from, from our side, we supported the talks taking place. Uh, we would, of course, like to have seen a bit more information from the government side on, on actually what this was and what this wasn't. I think that could have, could have helped. But basically, uh, to, to have a dialogue open to try to exert influence uh, is positive when you can, over time, see some results. And it's too soon to say whether or not that will happen. Mm. Samina, uh, it's, uh, uh, as mentioned, it created a lot of emotions and feelings having the Taliban here in Norway, but uh, 
if you are going to influence them, if you have any possibility, you have to facilitate talk to it. You have to talk and have a dialogue with Taliban. There's, there's no way out of it, isn't it? I mean, I was very positive uh, to the dialogue with the Taliban, not just uh, with the Taliban in Norway, but even before that, because there were a lot of dialogues with the Taliban on multiple occasions in Doha, but also in other countries in the region uh, throughout the entire so-called peace process, which is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I do uh, want to give legitimacy to the feelings of uh, betrayal that a lot of mm -hmm. Afghans and also international people felt, uh, because... Taliban as a group, uh, they have just received uh, so far uh, without giving very little back. Mm -hmm. and, and even when the Taliban were in Oslo, they were very much on the receiving end of um, almost gaining what they needed to gain from this. And a lot of them felt that, that this was a legitimacy to them, even though the government was incredibly clear about that this is not what this is about. Many of them felt that. Um, and also returning back to Afghanistan, they were invited to Geneva afterwards. So uh, Norway uh, taking the step to lead uh, this process, I believe is positive if something concrete com can come out of these uh, dialogues. Mm. Mm. Uh, in a, if, uh, if the Taliban regime wants international legitimacy, which it seems that they want, uh, we should ask some price back to, to give them that. Uh, how do you view that? Well, I, I think, that, and I, I fully agree with Tamina here, because um, it is absolutely, uh, I don't think, on any country's list right now to recognize the Taliban as a legitimate ruler. But not recognizing is not the same as not realizing that they are de facto in power. And as you mentioned earlier on, the humanitarian crisis is growing by the day. And now some 24 million people are in need of immediate humanitarian assistance. A million children is at risk of dying of hunger. And you have drought, you have uh, a food crisis, and you have, in addition to that, um, a, a crisis that also stems from the pandemic. So all of this, on top of everything, makes it extremely important to also have a practical dialogue with the, with the Taliban in order to get aid into the country and get aid distributed because they are de facto in charge and decides whether or not you open the border for humanitarian aid, whether or not you are allowing it to be distributed around the, con distributed around the country. And all of these things needs to be dealt with in a very, I would say, <laughs> an emotional but practical way in order to help the Afghans who are, who are in need at the moment. Mm. Uh, so, so, of course, they, I mean, the Taliban, as you say, they are on the lookout for international recognition. And they may have felt, even though, as you say, the government was very clear on the fact that this was not a recognition. The U.S. was equally clear. The EU was. The U.N. was. Um, but they may have felt that just being invited to the table was some sort of a recognition. I think they woke up to a very different reality afterwards because it, nothing came out of it that even resembled recognition, but maybe a path towards understanding how they can uh, be, I would say, how they can be um, engaged in actually allowing, for instance, humanitarian aid in. But this is a really really um, long road ahead and a very difficult road ahead. And, and I do think that it's interesting to see how they are now also, uh, I mean, one of the biggest changes I would say with the Taliban is also how they relate to, to the international community and try to use, for instance, social media in, in a way of kind of changing the narrative as they did when, when they came to Oslo. That means that we also have to counter that narrative in order not to make it look like uh, they have some sort of a recognition or 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 a legitimacy that they actually do not have and and the most important legitimacy they will have at any point in time any any ruler will be the people um, of Afghanistan and and the will of the people of Afghanistan mm. uh, Eldridge from your point of view how should the international community approach the Taliban government I mean there are a lot of challenges in Afghanistan humanitarian crisis growing by by the day and obviously other challenges. Uh, how should the international community approach this, these problems? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, first of all, I, I think I just want to also uh, 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 concur with my colleagues here that dialogue is important. As a peacemaker, as a mediator myself, there's no way you're going to resolve these things if you don't dialogue. Now, how you do it, we can always get into the details of that, but, but I think dialogue, first of all, has to be uh, present. Now, uh, uh, I think that, um, uh, uh, and Samina uh, uh, mentioned that a little bit, that uh, uh, you had 
the, uh, the Emirate coming to Oslo, but they didn't give anything, you know, lots been given to them. And, and some sort of benchmarking must be created here. Somehow we must have some sort of benchmarks that if you do this, we can do that. And, but we have to also be fair to them and to the country because, uh, uh, and, and this is a, a feature of what is happening in, in discussions today with them, is that when uh, the UK speaks to the Taliban, they speak about everything except the constitution because the UK doesn't have a constitution, right? Uh, but then when Norwegians come, they speak about the constitution because they have a constitution. And when the Swedes come, they speak about women's rights, yeah? And then the Saudis come and they have a problem with women, so they don't speak about women. But collectively, what happens is that we're all asking them to, to provide a perfect government and a perfect solution uh, within a short place of time, which is not really going to... I mean, even if you look back at Bonn uh, in 2001, you had the agreement, and then you still had, what, four or five years to write up the constitution, and you had all the diplomats, experts, all these people in there to help doing this. So you can't expect the Taliban to give all these answers in a few weeks, right? So. I think that what we need to do as the international community is come together and actually agree on a number of benchmarks, four or five things. These are the five things, the red lines as well, that must be uh, adhered to, and maybe even with the timeline. You know, in, in six months, in a year, we want this point, we want that point, so that it actually allows progress to be made on those things. And based on those benchmarks, we can then also engage. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going beyond uh, humanitarian, if you like, and this is my own personal uh, view. It's not view of my government or anything like that. Uh, I'm, I'm going beyond uh, 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 humanitarian. I'm talking about development and stuff. Because the reality, uh, I think Ian was in, uh, clear with that, that while we're not recognizing, we must realize that they are the de facto government there. And it's not going to change in the next two months. Mm -hmm. So the people on the ground, we also have a responsibility for them. There's 36 million people there. We cannot just... Uh, 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 you know, cut the pipe off and make sure that 36 million people suffer. They did not vote for these people, mm. right? Mm. So how do we then make sure we help uh, uh, them, the people, but we're going to have to engage with, with, with uh, the immigrants? Mm. You're raising your pen, so I guess you want me to stop. Yeah, stop. yeah. <laughs> I just want to have a follow-up with, with, with Hina in, in terms of benchmarking. You could say that 20 years of Afghanistan is history of failed benchmarks <laughs> in terms of uh, reaching many of many of them. But is is, is this an, an an way you would support that we should have some some benchmark that we can see if we are on the right path uh, or not, and 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 and, and move on. Well, I think benchmarks are absolutely necessary. I mean, this cannot be an open-ended dialogue where we try to, to influence the, the values of the Taliban and, and make them allow girls into schools and, and adhering to human rights. But I, I, I do think that there is still um, things to be done when it comes to their understanding of governance. Uh, they seized power, but they have to realize that they now are in power. Uh, they are responsible in a way they haven't been before. And that, in my opinion, uh, I think it was a bit surprising to them as well that it was so easy to seize power in August and that they suddenly were left with a lot of responsibilities that they were unable to deal with, uh, at least in the immediate aftermath of, of the power takeover. Uh, I also think that equally important as us uh, having the same views and discussing uh, what should be done and what benchmarks should be set, I think it is extremely important to engage the regional countries who can lead by an example to the Taliban on how to include human rights, uh, how to deal with uh, humanitarian suffering, how to deal with uh, education for, for girls and women in a way that is not, as Elrich said, threatening to, um, to their kind of basic views of, of Islam. Um, and I think that's going to be more and more important because I don't think that Western countries on our own will have a decisive influence on this with the Taliban. Yes, we can set benchmarks. Yes, we can um, We can also try to, to influence as much as possible and never be naive as to the difference between what they say and what they do. But I also think that countries in the region need to step up because unless they do, I think it will be extremely difficult to have an, I would say a, a groundbreaking change in how the Taliban deals with this. Mm. Just a quick follow-up, you know, before I move to, to Samina. You say you're in favor of benchmarks, that there cannot be an open and the dialogue. But then the result could be isolation if they don't meet those benchmarks. Wouldn't that be the case? 
And th and that is, of course, one of the many, many dilemmas posed with this dialogue. But as both Samina and Elbrus says, it is probably not an alternative to uh, just to isolate this regime. Uh, and we have to try to, I would say, preserve some of the um, good progress that has been made over the past, uh, past 20 years. It is not easy under the current circumstances, um, but to, to keep and to hold the Taliban responsible is also a part of the dialogue. And, and that is why I'm, I'm saying that this cannot be an open-ended kind, of, um, kind of discussion where we don't put benchmarks and don't put demands on the table. Uh, and I think that there is a, I would say a, a fairly united international community as to what these benchmarks should be. So it shouldn't be a very difficult thing to do. The challenge will meet us the day and some of the benchmarks are not met. And what do we do with uh, everything from humanitarian assistance that is unpolitical and can be uh, dispersed, but also the long-term development assistance, because the humanitarian assistance is not in any way able to substitute um, the, I would say, the long-running school system, health system, um, food uh, deliveries and so forth uh, in, in the long term. So, so we need both. Mm. Samina, uh, one thing is how the international community approach Afghanistan, which is obviously very important, uh, uh, also for the other factions in, in Afghanistan. And, and I want to ask you about them, the civil society you mentioned earlier. Uh, what, what do they expect or hope from the international community and, and how can we sort of empower them in this situation? It seems very difficult under this Taliban regime. Is there any window of opportunity to do anything for the civil society which are not Taliban in Afghanistan? Absolutely. And I think just going back to the argument of isolation, uh, Afghanistan and the de facto government, they have been isolated already, uh, at least for the first six months before the dialogue in Oslo happened. And we see that the results of that is that the Afghan people ended up starving. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that also falls under the responsibility of the de facto government because they are leading the country right now. And when it comes to the civil society, Eldridge and I have done uh, a lot of work the last uh, couple of years to co-found an inclusive peace mechanism where we wanted the Afghan civil society to tell the international community what they wanted um, and also put forward an action plan of how they were going to implement uh, whatever the future government of Afghanistan will be. So right now, our goal is to continue engaging with the Afghan society because one of the gains for us is to try to maintain maintain that link so that Afghan people themselves can continue rebuilding their country, also under the Taliban regime. So the co question now is, how much access can we have to the Afghan society right now with the Taliban and government? What can the civil society in Afghanistan do and not do? Uh, can we have women to be a part of the public space? Can these women travel freely to other provinces? Because not all power is in Kabul. We have 34 provinces in and Afghanistan. And if you answer your own questions, what would the answer be? I think right now the challenge is that the leverage of starving the Afghan people is something that the Taliban are also using. Um, and, and the conversation is stuck with that. And, and we need to move beyond that. Um, and just going back to what Ina said earlier about, we need to also speak about the development of the country. Um, aid is not enough. Uh, we have organizations, also Norwegian organizations, working with aid in Afghanistan right now. Um, uh, for example, the Norwegian Afghanistan Committee. And what they're telling us is that aid will not be sufficient uh, for, for this crisis. Mm. Uh, we are moving towards the end, Eldridge. So, uh, I want to hear your final thoughts about the future. What is realistic to expect from Afghanistan? Could we see a totally devastating humanitarian crisis which can end with millions of deaths? Is that a, is that a, a danger? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's certainly a danger. But, but before I go there, maybe I just want to go a little bit back to, sure. uh, to the benchmarking. Yeah. And because it talks to the future as well. And, and, and I think that um, while I'm in favor of this sort of thing, I think we need to be careful of how we do it as well. Because if we then try and impose this upon the Taliban, they will absolutely reject it. Even if it's things they want, they will reject it quite simply because they have had a victory right now. They have won. They are victorious. You know? So nobody, sh and, in, and in many of the groups like them, uh, they're looking at them as heroes. So you cannot, international community cannot then go down and start imposing it. So we need to be for the approach, right? And then they may be able to, to do some things. But if we impose, they will absolutely reject it. Um, 
the way forward would be that, I would think, that there has to be some dialogue needs to continue. Benja? Yeah, I think we just lost you, Aldrich. Do you have me back now? Yeah, so 30 yeah, seconds okay. uh, in the end here. Okay, great. Uh, um, so if, if I, I think a little bit of a shame with the evacuations, because what you did is you also took away all the capacity all the capacity to actually govern and help govern the state. And now what you have is, a, is the next two layers down, and that's going to be very difficult, even if you have all of these things in place, actually run the country. So how do you balance that out is going to be important. I don't want to go to the doomsday scenario, but that's a possibility, of course. But, you know, as, as a peacemaker, all we have is hope, and we hope that we'll do enough to evade uh, a doomsday scenario. So uh, I'll finish there. If that's my 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. Th yeah. Th th thank you, Adrian. Uh, Samina, your final thoughts here. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of fears. There are a lot of challenges. Um, what do you realistically hope for Afghanistan moving forward now? And, and, and what do you like to see? Uh, I spoke to a friend of mine, um, an Afghan friend of mine, who is currently evacuated. And he said that uh, Afghans are so used to starting uh, all over again uh, throughout history. Um, the only difference is that every time we start all over, there's another layer of trauma on top of it. Um, but I think that, you know, Afghans, they will continue to fight. Historically, they have proved that they always fight uh, for their rights and for their well-being because those are Afghan values as well. They're, these are not Western values to fight for freedom. Um, and I think that in my life, you know, I'm going to continue to support them with anything that I can, whether it is to support, you know, engagement of civil society to um, be a part of developing a future for their country, whether it is to support Afghan civil society in Norway or in Europe to engage in dialogue. Um, I, I am hopeful. Mm. Uh, and, and just a quick follow up, uh, Samina, before we end, because we talked a lot about how the Taliban movement uh, may or may not have changed, but the, it's a totally different Afghan population mm -hmm. given the 20 years. I mean, the things that they could have been accepting in 2001, they will not accept, especially women will not accept. That's, that's the impression I'll, I'll, I'll get. You know much more about this. How has the Afghan population changed these 20 years? I mean, you can see that in, in art. And I think you can see that with any nation. Uh, whenever there is um, uh, a development or a flourish in, in the art and cultural sector, you understand that the boundaries of freedom are expanded. So uh, I have been doing some work with Afghan female artists, and I see that these women are the product of the last 20 years. Um, and Afghan women will not be happy with just um, you know, having the right to exist, they would, would they would want to continue developing their their skill sets um, and fight towards freedom. Mm. Uh, in your your final thought, uh, it's important for Norway and the international community in in this situation with Ukraine not to forget Afghanistan. Is mm -hmm. there a danger that we just forget Afghanistan like we did in the nineties? Well, I think there is a real risk that there is now a crisis overload in the world, meaning that any crisis we have, whether it's humanitarian, political, it's a war, uh, can be in a way put on hold in our attention because something else is even more acute. And we don't have to go back many weeks uh, before Afghanistan were all we talked about because the crisis is so dire. So, so we need to keep up uh, our attention span on, on all of this, uh, which is in a way uh, difficult also. I think one of the things that will be very important when we talk about the Taliban also in the future and how to put pressure on them, how regional countries can put pressure on them, how the international community can, we have to remember that we're not doing this, having this dialogue to serve the Taliban. We're doing this to try to help the Afghan people. And I think that is very rooted in, in the souls of, of many of us who have been dealing with this for, for many years, that we, we want sincerely to have a better future for the Afghan people. That has suffered a huge setback when the Taliban took power in August. Things were not moving absolutely on rails before that either, either. But as I think we have all alluded to, there has been some significant progress, who is, I would say, a lasting progress, hopefully. 
but the takeover of the Taliban has, has severely disrupted the path towards more development in Afghanistan. And that is what the international community has to deal with today. Mm. Ina, Samina, Eldridge, thank you so much for joining and, and sharing your thoughts. Before we end, let me just remind everybody that uh, Civita will keep uh, uh, hosting events and hopefully also more with physical audience uh, moving forward. Just check civita.no for future events. Thank you all for joining and thank you all for watching. Have a great day. Thank you.